Well, good afternoon, everyone. I appreciate you taking some time to join us once again for our continued discussions on COVID workplace safety. Uh, as I have mentioned many times within the Department of Labor and Economic Opportunity, we are hyper focused on helping businesses get open and stay open as we continue to fight COVID and try to contain COVID in our communities and that we're certainly going to keep pushing forward. This is the second part in our series on ventilation or uh, ventilation and other changes or considerations you should make in your workplace or place of business that might help uh, mitigate some of the spread of COVID as we move indoors this fall and winter. Uh, it, the chance of that transmission has uh, of that aerosol and everything hanging around goes up. So we really want to be aware of what's happening with our HVAC systems and other ventilation in our areas. Last week we did a general overview and update uh, that certainly included uh, a lot of the pieces you're going to hear about today, but we're going to focus in more today to talk about ventilation, one of those great tools that can help us mitigate the spread of COVID and something that you should be considering. Uh, if you have questions throughout this presentation, there is a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen that you could submit questions. We will try to get to as many as we can at the end of our presentation. Uh, one of the things we always like to remind everyone of is that while the science and noise around COVID as we're working towards vaccines and other things, there's a lot of news. There's a 24 hour news cycle and sometimes it can be hard to keep up with what's happening, but some of the things have remained absolutely the same since the beginning of this crisis. And that includes how important it is to maintain that social distance. The uh, virus largely spreads through uh, large respiratory droplets that come out of us when we talk, sneeze, cough, sing, you name it. Uh, and then certainly some of those aerosols we create when we talk or when we cough or sneeze can hang around longer depending on conditions. And uh, when and wearing those face coverings to make sure that we're pulling any potential uh, aerosols or droplets that we're expelling close to our bodies. And masks have shown in some studies to pull that back with to, to within a few inches depending on the type of face covering you're wearing. And then practicing good hygiene because the virus can still be transmitted through surfaces. And if we touch a contaminated surface and then our eyes, nose, or mouth, we can infect ourselves that way as well. Those concepts have remained the same throughout this crisis. And we have to just keep reminding ourselves that while we're dealing with a lot of change as we're learning more about COVID, these are keys to making sure that we help contain the transmission. And the science tells us that some 40% of the spread of this virus is, are coming from folks that are asymptomatic. That means that they feel fine and they're gonna continue to feel fine as we uh, move forward. So those that social distance, those face coverings and that good hygiene are just absolutely critical to making sure that we contain <clears throat> COVID. We have a lot of materials available for all types of workplaces available at michigan.gov slash COVID workplace safety. This includes guidance for every industry that was named in an executive order, uh, as well as general industry guidelines for industries that might not have been named specifically. This includes things like posters, videos, fact sheets that you can use to really identify how to make your workplace more safe and help us to contain the spread of COVID in workplaces. There's a hotline that you can use that goes directly into MyOSHA. It's a wonderful tool. It's 855-SAFE-C19 that is available for employers and employees to call in with COVID related safety questions. The wait time on that's been about 15 seconds. That's right, about 15 seconds to get to a MyOSHA expert that can help you navigate through some of the questions you may have as this uh, as we continue to battle COVID in, in the state of Michigan. We have a lot of links to other websites there that can help you that MEDC PMBC is the Pure Michigan Business Connect that'll connect you to Michigan manufacturers that are making hand sanitizer, plastic barriers, face coverings, you name it. Uh, and then one of the critical pieces is those daily health screenings to try to keep COVID out of our workplaces altogether the My Symptoms app created by DHHS as well as the University of Michigan allows employers to set up an account where their employees will be given a code that they can use to conduct that daily health screening questionnaire piece on and trying to flag for potential symptoms of COVID. So make sure you take advantage of and use these tools. 
Uh, they are uh, great tools and resources that My Symptoms app itself is free. Uh, it's a great, a great resource for businesses out there. And then make sure you're watching the Safe Start site as well as what's going on in our communities. I can tell you that we're continuing to have outbreaks in the workplace, all types of workplaces, some more than others, all across the state of Michigan. So it's critical that we continue to remain vigilant as we move forward in our battle to get open and stay open in the face of COVID. Now today, of course, we're here to talk with our great friends and uh, the experts from ASHRAE on things that you can consider within your HVAC system that can help to mitigate the spread of COVID in these environments. So I'm gonna turn it over to our friend, Sonia Pouncey, who has put together a wonderful presentation and will share information with you today. Thank you so much, Sean. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. And I, I just wanna make you aware, I have with me here uh, a um, very distinguished member of uh, the uh, Government of Activities Committee uh, at ASHRAE, Simon Wren, is on the line as well. Uh, he will be assisting with, excuse me, uh, the fielding of questions and um, anything that I may miss. So let's just dig right into it. Uh, so I am on the second slide, the disclaimer slide. <clears throat> and I just want to say, um, Sean mentioned it initially, but I want to just kind of reiterate that um, everything with COVID is um, emerging, it's changing, it's, you know, things are, are moving very fast and um, it is uh, sometimes a challenge to keep up with everything. So, um, but, you know, everybody makes their best effort to do that. So the information that you'll see in this presentation uh, is members of the Detroit uh, chapter of ASHRAE have um, put forth their best effort to to make sure that everything is current uh, and up to date up to the last minute, but um, things do change. And so we want you to just be aware of that. Also be aware that um, as members of the Detroit chapter, we do not speak for the International Society at all. Um, we are, uh, uh, each, each chapter is responsible for itself. All right, uh, and also we so we don't guarantee any of the recommendations or things that we're making in this presentation. This is for information purposes, and we're going to be talking in generalities. Uh, we strongly encourage you, um, if you're interested in making some changes to your HVAC system, that you engage a um, an HVAC specialist. Uh, that person may or may not be a member of, of ASHRAE, uh, but as long as they're an HVAC specialist, that's what you're looking for um, <clears throat> so that they can look specifically at your equipment and figure out what you need. Okay, next slide. Um, as Sean mentioned, we've got two uh, additional uh, seminars in this series. It's a four-part series. Uh, we've got, uh, in, in two weeks coming up, we'll be talking about filtration and air cleanliness. And then on the 29th, uh, we'll be closing out the month talking about humidification. And we hope that you do um, have time to participate in those sessions as well. Uh, a little bit about ASHRAE for those of you who may not know us. I know that some of you maybe were on the call <clears throat> two weeks ago, but there may be some new folks in the room. And so uh, just a little bit about ASHRAE. We are the American Society of Heating, Refrigerating, and Air Conditioning Engineers. Um, and we uh, basically, uh, our, our goal is to further and advance the arts and sciences of HVAC and related fields. We do a number of things in the industry. Uh, the two big things that we do are our research. Uh, we recently completed a, a research project over at, um, at Lawrence Tech looking at uh, assessing the impact in, uh, of our standards and, and our technologies. Um, we've also we've got an existing uh, research project going on in Ann Arbor right now, looking at demand control ventilation for clean rooms, which is kind of an interesting thing. And then several years ago, we did a project with MSU looking at um, a woven compressor using water as the refrigerant. So no Freon, no CFCs, HCFCs, or any of that, um, just using pure water as the refrigerant. We're also, uh, next slide, <clears throat> the other thing that we do uh, is we write standards. And some of our flagship standards uh, end up as the basis of building codes for states. Um, <clears throat> some of the standards that 
are in Michigan's uh, building codes are a standard 90.1, uh, which is the energy standard for commercial buildings, uh, as well as our standard 180, which looks at uh, inspection and maintenance for commercial HVAC systems. Uh, the standard <clears throat> that uh, you may be most interested in today uh, is our 62.1, which um, a portion of which is included in Michigan's mechanical code, uh, specifically the portions related to uh, the determination of acceptable ventilation rates uh, for outdoor air for various spaces. Next slide. You will also find us listed on the CDC's website for its COVID-19 uh, resources and guidance. <clears throat> so a couple of our standards are there as well. Next slide. And just a little bit of context about where buildings fit in with all the other things that we've been doing to kind of prevent or at least slow the spread of COVID-19. There are uh, five approaches to safety or safety controls, the most basic of which is the PPE that we're all wearing. And with a virus, this is our best initial response. So like Sean said at the top of the meeting, continue masking up. Um, after that comes the social distancing, right? That is um, an, an, an example of an administrative control, asking people to do something differently. So now when we greet each other, we don't, uh, we don't hug or, or kiss, right? We do a fist bump or we do an elbow bump. Um, and then we resume our six foot distance, right? Um, <clears throat> But um, as you've likely heard in recent media reports, um, our standard six foot may not be enough, right? And so the next best thing that we can do is change the environment. And our HVAC systems help us to do that. Next slide. <clears throat> um, so, before we make any changes to our system, though, it's very, very important that we recognize and understand uh, and appreciate the fact that the HVAC components are actually designed to work together in a cohesive system, even though they may not all come from the same manufacturer, um, even they, though they may not all be installed at the same time. They work together <clears throat> as a unit. And so if we make changes to any one piece, it's definitely going to impact other components in the system. And so some of those impacts will be, will be additive. Some of them will be synergistic. Some of them will be antagonistic, right? Um, so we need to just make sure that we're aware of this potentiality um, and plan for this and uh, in our, um, <clears throat> as we're considering what changes to make to our system. Next slide. Um, before we make any changes, um, it is also imperative that we understand our system, that we know um, how it's supposed to work, um, what its set points are, and why those set points are there, what its limitations are, and why those limitations are there. The last thing that you want to do is to start making some changes to your system um, without a, a clear plan, um, a, a clear approach, or rationale for um, for the choices that you make, um, because it could have um, you know, significant undesirable um, consequences. So we want to make sure that we start off with reviewing and you know, having at our disposal um, our operating system operating manuals and other documents related to our facility. Um, if you don't already have a document library, I encourage you to start one uh, where you house all of the information uh, relative to the operation, the maintenance, um, and the commissioning of your um, equipment. Next slide. So the first thing we're going to want to do before we, again, and I know I got a lot of stuff before we make our changes, right, because we've got to make sure that we get these things right. And so uh, the next thing that you're going to want to do after you've you know, assembled information for your system and you, un you have a good understanding of it is you're going to assemble your team. Right? You're going to want to pick people to be on your, on your readiness team or your reopening team um, or your continued operations team. 
depending on um, the state that you happen to be in. And those people that are going to be on your team, some of them will be from within your organization. They may be your facilities or maintenance staff, but some of them may be outside your organization. You may have a commissioning professional um, service provider. Uh, help you out on your project, or if you've got a contractor that you work with on a regular basis, you may have that entity help you out on the project as well. So you want to make sure that you've got uh, a, the, the team uh, is <clears throat> consists of all the stakeholders uh, or representation of all the stakeholders in your facility and in its proper operation. All right, again, then we want to take a look at that current facility manual. Um, if that's available, and if not, this is a great opportunity to, to start one. Um, we also want to make sure that we document every change that we make. Um, you want to be able to go back and look, you know, when you're, you know, a couple of weeks or a couple of months down the road, you want to be able to look back and see what changes you made and whether or not those changes were effective, what were their impacts. Um, you want to be able to make decisions about um, how to move forward. Do you want to keep these changes in place or do you want to uh, revert to, to previous um, operating and maintenance protocols? So you want to document everything. Um, and you want to make sure that you have a date that you're going to revisit um, all of these temporary measures and, and go back and double check them. Uh, and monitoring, tracking, and trending is essential. <clears throat> if you're going to make a change to your system, you want to know if that change produces the results that you want. And the only way that you're going to know that is to monitor and track it and trend it over time. Some of these changes that you may be making to your system uh, are going to impact <clears throat> not just the operation, but also the cost of operating your building. And so there, there may be additional energy costs. There may be additional maintenance costs. And so you want to make sure that you're tracking these things so that you can uh, make informed decisions um, as you go along. Right. And then uh, if, you, if you don't already do uh, regular building performance reviews, you want to incorporate that into your standard uh, operating procedures for your facility as well. Next slide. <clears throat> Still not to making changes yet. Now we're at maintenance. Um, one of the um, biggest causes of poor indoor air quality is poor ventilation. We're going to be talking about ventilation today. The and usually about uh, some studies are showing that you know typically more than fifty percent of IAQ problems are related to ventilation. The next biggest category of uh, causes of poor indoor air quality is lack of maintenance. Maintenance gets deferred for all sorts of reasons. Uh, we've got limited budgets. We uh, had personnel turnover. Um, we've got aged systems, um, just all sorts of reasons. And I can't stress enough how important it is to take care of and maintain your HVAC equipment. <clears throat> Most times we don't think about this equipment because it's in our basement somewhere, but this is the equipment that is developing and sustaining the air in your building that you're breathing. And so if you don't take care of this equipment, this equipment can't take care of you. So you want to make sure that you, um, if you've got some deferred maintenance, schedule it, get it done. Uh, you want to make sure that you regularly inspect your equipment, and you want to do that both when it's operating and when it's not. There are certain there are different things that you will note, be able to notice or see or observe about the equipment in those various states. So you want to do both of them. Uh, you want to make sure that you check just not not just the, the the gross large piece of equipment, but you also want to dig down and check the controls and the sensor, sensors and the actuators. Make sure that all of those things are working because if they're not working, then the, the piece of equipment isn't going to work. And then anything that you find that's broken or not working properly, repair it or replace it. Okay. And very important right now, um, always important, but specifically right now because we're dealing with COVID, 
um, is that anybody, any staff members that you have that are going to come in contact with potentially contaminated equipment, uh, you want to make sure that they're wearing appropriate PPE, right? That may mean gloves, that may mean um, a, a respirator. Um, it, it, <clears throat> we want to make sure that we protect um, those who are um, taking care of our, of our equipment and our systems. Next slide. So when we talk about maintenance, um, if your facility has any of these things in it, right, if you've got some exhaust grills that uh, look like this, uh, you know, upper left hand image, or if you've got some supply diffusers, my goodness, uh, that look like that bottom, um, or if you've got, you know, filters jammed into your air handler and they're just kind of scrunched in there any old kind of way, and they're very dirty, obviously old, haven't been changed in quite a while, and lots of gaps, lots of air bypass opportunities. Um, or if the filters are just laying on top of the roof curb because they got pulled out of the unit for some reason and they were, that, that was the most convenient place to put them or holes in your ductwork, right? Um, these are examples of poor HVAC hygiene. Uh, we've been talking <clears throat> under the, the, the event of um, the coronavirus, right, about our hand hygiene, constantly washing our hands. Well, we also want to make sure that we keep our mechanical rooms clean and our equipment clean. Again, this is the equipment through which the air that we're breathing travels. And so if this equipment isn't clean, it's going to be difficult for this equipment to clean the air that we're breathing. Next slide. So when we talk about acceptable indoor air quality, what exactly do we mean? So acceptable indoor air is air that in which there's no known contaminants at harmful concentrations um, and with which a substantial majority of people do not express dissatisfaction. So there are two components here to this definition to, to really give uh, consideration to. The first one is um, health, right? We talk about harmful concentrations of known contaminants, right? So from the get-go, we're concerned about people's health. Um, and then at, at the, 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 the bottom of the definition, right, we're asking that people not express dissatisfaction with this air. Right, which means their comfort. We want people to be able to be comfortable in this air that we're providing as well. And there are four ways that we can really do that, uh, make sure that the air is healthy and make sure that the people are comfortable as well. Uh, we can limit pollution at the source, but that's a little difficult, particularly with a virus where you know people are bringing the virus into the space. Um, you could isolate, and we, we do that to a degree, right? When someone, you know, tests positive uh, or, or is exposed, we, we ask them to isolate. So we are isolating them. We're asking them to not come to our public, to the public spaces. You know, don't come to work. Um, don't go to the grocery store, things of that nature. Um, but the, the last two ways that we can really do this is with ventilating and cleaning the air that's in that space. And then also maintaining building hygiene, right? Next slide. So let's take a little deeper look at ventilation. This is the process of supplying air or removing air from your space um, for the purpose of controlling tent level, uh, humidity, or temperature, right, of the air within the space. Now. Although much of the air that's supplied um, uh, to the space is recirculated air that had previously been in the space but has now been cleaned and conditioned, um, an important component of that ventilation air is the outdoor air percentage, right? This is air that has not been previously used. Next slide. And continuously bringing in this outdoor air helps us to dilute the concentration of pollutants in the space. Right, as shown in this graph here. So regardless, this graph is showing, regardless of the pollutant strength, the higher the ventilation rate, the more times we change that outdoor air, um, the lower the pollutant concentration in the space. Next slide. And this is important uh, in the face of the coronavirus and other viruses too, like the flu virus and the rhinovirus, the common cold virus, right? 
Because we know that once they're expelled from someone talking or sneezing or even just breathing, right, they can travel farther than six feet before dropping to the floor where they can do less harm, right? And they can linger in the air for hours or days, but sometimes even weeks. So, <clears throat> next slide. So although ventilation cannot totally eliminate the virus, it can't get rid of it in, entirely, um, but concurrent with its reducing the concentration of the virus or of pollutants in the space, it can also significantly help by reducing the probability or the likelihood that viral particles from one person uh, will infect others in the space. Next slide. Now there are two broad categories of ventilation, natural and mechanical. This presentation is going to primarily focus on the mechanical, but we will touch on some of the natural uh, modes of, of ventilation towards the end of the presentation. Okay. So before we begin talking about increasing ventilation rates, the first thing you want to do after you've got your team in place and you've uh, figured out what you guys are going to be doing, you want to make sure that part of that team is your TAB contractor, your testing and balance contractor. This is probably uh, the contractor that balanced your air system to begin with, right? Because you've got air flows in, air flows out, um, and we need to make sure that everything is balanced and working properly. And so the person who does that, they are called a testing and balancing contractor. We want to make sure that we engage them if we're going to be making uh, some changes because they're the best person to help us make um, the right changes and then to test everything afterward. Okay, so before we bring people back into our facility, if the facility has been closed for a while, we want to um, do a flush, right? We want to get out, the, the building has been sitting very similar to, you know, a, a, a pipe in your home or uh, some standing water, right? You've got this building that's closed, you've got standing air, right? So we need to change that air. We need to get rid of all that stale air and bring in fresh air. So if we operate our uh, HVAC system, if we flush that building for four hours um, or, or longer, uh, we would be able to achieve, you know, four to eight full air changes. And that would be sufficient to kind of to get that, that dirty, stale air out of there. Now, of course, if the facility doesn't have uh, the ability to do that, um, it has limited outside air capabilities, then we can consider, you know, next steps. We would open windows and doors. We might use temporary exhaust fans, uh, things of that nature. But if we can do this with our HVAC system, that would be best. It's a central system and it covers the entire facility. Um, <clears throat> then we want to make sure, so after we flush the building, we want to operate it in occupied mode for 20 hours, 24 hours. And this gives us time to go back and, and look at everything and do our checks and make sure that everything is working just like it's supposed to, making sure that everything is functioning the way we want it to be. Uh, we may need to recommission some things or retro commission if they hadn't been commissioned before, uh, but we uh, have that opportunity if we're if we're looking at things as in the operating mode and we can see where our attention is needed. And then once we reopen the facility and let folks back in, uh, we want to try to get uh, three full air changes of outside air uh, before and after occupancy. Um, if we uh, if, if there's some challenges with figuring out, okay, but well, do I have three full air changes or not? Um, very simple way, just you know, let the system run for you know two, two to three hours, but definitely you know, at least two, minimum of two hours. So four, you know, four hours total, two hours before and two hours after occupancy, and that should get you there. Next slide. So, how much? Additional ventilation do we want to bring into the building? Well, as much as you can, right? So we've got some things that we need to consider. We need to consider the equipment. Does it have the capacity to do what we're asking it to do? Um, what about the facility? Uh, does the facility have the capacity <clears throat> in terms of uh, additional energy that may be required? And then what's our budget going to allow? Can we afford it? Do we have the money to do that? Um, these are the three uh, you know, main things that we need to be thinking about as we're looking at increasing the ventilation in our space. Next slide. Um, so when we increase the ventilation, um, you know, we've got to be concerned with, um, again, changes elsewhere in the system. 
so in this particular, these graphs here, this is an example, we're looking at a 10,000 CFM air handler. And it's got a, a constant 44 degree entering water temperature. This is for a chilled water system. Uh, and it's got a constant leaving air temperature of around 52 degrees off the coil, um, saturated. And um, as we increase the amount of outdoor air on that coil for, uh, for that air handler, uh, from 20% outside air to up to 90% outside air, we can see the changes that it makes on system performance, right? So the chilled water flow rate is doubled. The, uh, the coil pressure drop is tripled, right? And the required cooling is also doubled. So when we increase that additional flow rate for that chilled water coil, that means that the chilled water pumps have to um, expend more energy to meet that new flow rate. And with that additional pressure drop, the fan has to expend more energy as well to be able to deliver uh, the amount of air that's required. And actually, in, 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 in cases like this, uh, the, the air delivery uh, from the fan will actually be decreased a little bit. So you won't even be bringing in as much air, uh, supply air to your system as, as you thought you were or had, as you have uh, possibly intended to do. Um, and then you can see, again, with the, the required cooling being doubled, you're asking for twice as much cooling from your cooling plant. Does your equipment have that excess capacity? Not every facility, not every system has that. If you've got a piece of redundant equipment, then perhaps. Um, but lots of times um, we uh, give ourselves just a cushion of, you know, 15, 20 percent, 25 percent, 30 percent on our equipment. Um, so we may not have a extra capacity to spare. Next slide. Thank you. Um, so some additional considerations when you're increasing the ventilation uh, rate for your facility. Um, as you're bringing in more outside air, that's going to increase the pressure in the building, and this can affect other things. So if you've got some, you know, some outward um, opening doors, like your main doors to the facility, you may find it that, that things like that are difficult to, to, to close. The doors may be difficult to close. There may be some additional noise, too, because you've got additional air, so the fan is doing a little bit more work. And you may run into situations where you see um, reversal of pressure differentials in various spaces, right? So like your, your kitchens and your bathrooms that are, that are spaces that are supposed to be negative uh, relative to the, the, the other spaces in the facility, your, your, your office areas, um, <clears throat> you may find that, that, these, that these spaces actually become positive. Um, you will definitely also um, need to make some space temperature set point changes. Um, when you're bringing in more outside air, the equipment uh, may not be able to keep up, and so you need to, um, you'll have to, to change the set points. And so instead of heating your building to 70, maybe you're only able to heat the building or heat the space to 68, right, or 67. And then we need to make sure that we uh, share that information with our building occupants so that they know what to expect, right? and that they understand why they may not be as comfortable in the building as they had previously been. And then we also need to uh, make some adjustments to our limit temperatures, right? We have limit temperatures on, on the equipment to protect the equipment, and we don't want to have things like uh, coils freezing up because the air temperature um, at the coil is too low uh, because we've brought in so much outside air and it's winter time and that air is cold. Next slide. Additionally, um, we need to make some other um, changes, and 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 I want to stress that these are these changes, all of the changes are really kind of temporary. But these in particular are temporary. So you may have a system uh, that is uh, doing demand control ventilation, which is an energy saving um, strategy, right? You just bring in the amount of outdoor air specifically for the number of people that are in the building, rather than um, the whole amount. Um, or you may do a static pressure reset to, uh, to, to reduce the static pressure that, that, that the fan has to generate. Um, and these energy saving features uh, may need to be uh, um, disabled uh, if you're going to be bringing in additional outside air because they would um, counteract the impact of bringing in that outside air and it would just create operational problems for the, for the equipment. Next slide. Lots of systems have uh, economizers. 
Um, and economizers are, um, you know, a series of interleaked dampers and, and uh, in, in conjunction with the air handling unit um, that allow you to use outdoor air uh, to provide cooling when temperatures are um, appropriate. So if you've got <clears throat> a cooling need at your facility, um, and it happens that, you know, because sometimes, you know, the, even though it may be cold outside or cooler outside, you still may need cooling in your building. And so if, you know, if that's the case, if it's, you know, if it's only 60 degrees outside and you just need it 70 in your space, it doesn't make sense to turn on your compressor and cool all that, uh, all that air down and waste all that energy. You can use a more significant proportion of outdoor air to help you do that. And so uh, with economizers, um, we can change uh, the amount of outside air that we're bringing in. We, we, have, that, we have that option. Uh, but some of the older uh, economizers um, don't unload as well as others, uh, and they, so they don't have great part load performance. So we may want to, and this, is, uh, this example here is just looking at a, a DX economizer. Um, so what we may want to, next slide. Um, <clears throat> either upgrade our economizer by adding some components to it, adding a, a perhaps a, a bypass or some low ambient controls to help it operate um, at, at reduced capacities when we don't need the full uh, uh, capacity, or we can upgrade our economizer. We can switch to an integrated um, economizer that allows us to uh, use outdoor air for cooling more uh, during more hours of the year. And it actually allows for uh, the use of outdoor air in conjunction with the mechanical cooling from the compressor. So even though um, you're, 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 you may require a compressor for your cooling, you can still uh, bring in some additional outdoor air. Um, energy recovery ventilators. Uh, lots of uh, facilities have these as well. They're, they are a, uh, a energy saving device uh, or a strategy really. Uh, when we bring in a, a large amounts of outside air, right, uh, we have to condition that air, which is kind of the reason that, that folks don't like to bring in the outside air, because you've got to you've got to spend money to condition it, you've got to clean it, you've got to cool it, or you've got to heat it. Well, if we use an energy recovery ventilator, um, that takes some of that burden off um, our, uh, our our air handling systems, our heating coils and our cooling coils and our compressors, and so. Uh, but there are some changes that we might want to make to those ERV systems uh, if we're going to be bringing in additional outside air. Um, so, uh, and some folks have uh, questions about whether or not they should even keep their energy recovery ventilators working, particularly uh, those that are using energy wheels, because there's the possibility of some cross contamination between return air and um, and out and fresh outdoor air. Um, however, the um, the the leakage between um, the return air and the outdoor air, uh, leakage rates of you know up to five, ten percent. Those are you know designed into the system, and those are within the standard allowance um, that's accounted for. Um, so if you've got a, a properly operating and well maintained energy recovery ventilator, I encourage you to keep using it. Now, note I've said properly operating and well maintained. If it's not properly operating and not well maintained, or if you're not sure whether it's well maintained or properly operating, don't use it. Okay. Next slide. Um, most energy recovery um, ventilators do use a measure of recirculated air. Um, and so if, if yours is using uh, some return air, Right, that uh, it's not all being exhausted. Some of it is actually being uh, reused by the by the system. <clears throat> Consider converting it to 100% outside air, uh, if that's practical. And again, you need a um, a, a designer, an HVAC system specialist, uh, and that could be you know your 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 contractor. It could be an engineer. Um, uh, but you need somebody to uh, to evaluate your system and determine whether or not it can be safely converted to 100% outside air. If the unit is already 100% outside air, we want to make sure that it is working properly, and we want to evaluate the possibility of air reentrainment. We want to make sure that that's not happening uh, where we don't want it to. 
And we also want to make sure that there's a, a, a an appropriate pressure differential between uh, the supply side and uh, and the return components to make sure that uh, any leakage that is happening uh, is within those standard design parameters and is leaking uh, from the clean side to the dirty side and not the other way. Next slide. Uh, for bathroom exhaust, a lot of facilities only have, uh, you know, smaller offices, smaller buildings, don't have big air handlers on the on the roof or, um, you know, with, within mechanical rooms on, on the floors. If you've got a small facility, it may only have bathroom exhaust, right? So the way that you get, you're ventilating the building, that particular space, is by exhausting air out through the bathroom fan. And by exhausting some air out, right, it, uh, air from outside is just going to move in through open doors, windows, um, small, you know, um, under door cracks, and other things like that in the in in the in the uh, in in the building envelope to uh, to bring that ventilation air in. Um, this is actually how a lot of um, older homes are are ventilated. Many, you know. Newer homes certainly have uh, ventilation systems, but a lot of older homes, particularly homes with boilers, don't, right? You get your ventilation by opening and closing doors, opening windows, things of that nature. So if you've got a bathroom exhaust system, very often those exhaust fans are tied into the light. So when somebody goes into the bathroom, the light comes on and the fan comes on. Well, if you're wanting to increase your ventilation rate, keep the fan on running. Let the fan run continuously. Um, and just as a safety measure here, uh, and we encourage you to disable your hand dryers um, because, you know, they're blowing things around the space, um, and that's just not what you need right now. Uh, and also, if, uh, if you've got that fan, um, you're, you're operating that, that fan uh, in that bathroom, you want to make sure that the floor drains. The floor traps are uh, are properly primed. They need to be filled with water. If they're not, you're going to get you know that um, the sewer gas smell in in the facility. And that's something to certainly take a look at if your facility has been closed. Um, ventilation through open windows. So if you if again if you don't have um, a central ventilation system, uh, you don't have a central air handler. Um, you can simply open windows. To get some additional ventilation in the space, and um, if you, you know, depending on the, the size of the windows relative to the size of the space, uh, you know, there are somewhere between five and uh, ten percent of the, the size of the room, uh, you'll get some cooling with that as well. Although, you know, you, you may find uh, at certain times of the the year that the that the space is a little bit warmer than it is um, outside, and, and but it's you know two, three, four degree differential. You know, it's not going to be 20 degrees hotter in the house than it is outside. Um, uh, and bringing in that, that fresh air, it's always best if you can do um, true cross ventilation. But if you can only do um, single-sided ventilation, uh, that will get you some uh, uh, airflow and air movement as well. Uh, you do want to be careful, though, with open windows. Certainly, they can they can be a security issue. They don't have to be, but they can be. Um, and certainly, open windows don't have the ability to filter, right? There's not a filter in the window, so you're getting what is ever whatever's outside, if it's pollen, um, if it's you know insects, what have you. And uh, depending on the nature of the system, you know, it could also uh, interact with your HVAC system. Um, next slide. Portable fans and heaters with fans, these are things that we want to avoid. We want to rely on the, the central HVAC system and that equipment to do its job. <clears throat> and if you've got some portable units with fans, I know that sometimes you know folks get hot or folks are cold and so they want their personal heater or fan at their desk. Um, I used to be one of those people, so believe me, I fully understand. Um, but <clears throat> Those things are, are again, they are uh, impacting the airflow in the space. And you know, when we talk about the fact that your HVAC system is a is a system and it's designed to operate, um, you know, together, you know, it's not just the fan and the air handler back in the mechanical room. The ductwork and the diffuser, the outlet, um, all of that is designed uh, to achieve a certain distribution of air and a mixing of air in the space and portable fans 
and heaters with fans uh, negatively impact that. So we want to make sure that we um, uh, disable any of those and let our, occup our building occupants know that they should not have that equipment. Um, a couple of um, common problems that we uh, may have with ventilation and just some, some tr troubleshooting um, assistance, right? So if you find that your, your ventilation level is too low after you know, you've made some changes, uh, you don't have enough outside air coming in, check your controls. Um, check to see if your sensors and your switches are working like they're supposed to. Um, you know, the, uh, the new uh, 90.1 standard, our new energy standard for the state here, um, uh, for, for Michigan's uh, energy code as well, uh, talks about the need to calibrate on a, on a regular basis our sensors. Lots of times we don't think about things like that, um, but those things uh, do get out of um, out of true, and we need to 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 recalibrate them. Also, look at things like your damper linkages. Are any linkages broken? Are they bent? Are they not? You know, what, what do they look like? Uh, filters. Are they clean? Are they if they're if they're dirty, they could be obstructing airflow, and that may be why you're not getting the ventilation that you think. Are your coils clean as well? Um, and are your fan have your fan belts been uh, looked at? Are they have they been tightened recently? Um, and then, of course, look to the ductwork. Are there any obstructions there uh, that may be uh, contributing to uh, a low flow rate for your, your ventilation air? Um, and then uh, if you don't have the amount of air that you want in the spaces that you want, right, then take a look at your ductwork and your supply diffusers as well as your occupant density, right? Are there, are there more people in the space? And so do you need to, you know, make some modifications to the, to the distribution system to bring more air or less air into a particular space? And those are definitely things to look at. Um, as, a, as an energy auditor, I've gone into a, a number of spaces and, you know, and invariably there's at least one in every building where uh, somebody has a, a piece of cardboard or a piece of plastic or something over the diffuser, you know, in their, in their office or in their, over their cubicle. Um, and so, you know, those are things that we don't want to see. We'd rather have the have the TAB contractor come back out and rebalance that system and get it working the way that it should be. Um, <clears throat> if you're going to be bringing in additional outside air, another concern is the quality of the outside air that you're bringing in. Um, so I, I would encourage you to consider um, an indoor air quality assessment um, to determine uh, your compliance with um, uh, Michigan's mechanical code for ventilation and ASHRAE 52.1 standard for acceptable indoor air quality. And the first step of this uh, uh, assessment is to determine whether your building is in an EPA attainment zone or not. So the EPA has some standards for um, some typical known pollutants and um, the entire country is divided up into spaces that are either attaining that or meeting that standard, meaning that the pollutants are lower than those threshold values, or they are non-attainment values or, or places where, the, where the, the, the pollutants exceed those values. And so we want to double check where our facility is. Here's the, um, the uh, attainment map for Michigan, and these are published on a regular basis by both the EPA and the state. You can go to the state's website or you can go to the EPA's website and download this document for uh, wherever your building may happen to be. Um, this is what the standard looks like for various uh, pollutants that we know about um, or that are typical in outside air. All right, um, uh, carbon monoxide, um, lead, um, uh, ozone, and then particulate matters, right? And so we have um, a, uh, a requirement for uh, or a threshold value, uh, a not to exceed value for each of these pollutants. And then we have some ASHRAE guidance on, on what we should be doing if we're in one of those non-attainment zones. And in particular, you'll note that if you're in a non-attainment zone for, for, for particulate matters, um, for particles um, that are, are for PM10 particles, uh, ASHRAE is uh, requiring a minimum uh, efficiency reporting value uh, for your filters of, of eight. So a MERV eight filter is required if you've exceeded the PM10 uh, thresholds. For PM2.5, um, and the 2.5 and the 10 are the size of the particle and micrometers. 
Um, and for PM 2.5, if you exceed that threshold, then uh, or if, the, if the outdoor air, the ambient air outdoor exceeds the threshold values with the time limit here, uh, then ASHRAE requires a MERV 11 particulate filter. Um, for most of the, the, uh, the other um, pollutants, uh, the standard just requires that the assumptions and calculations uh, be included in the design documents, and those assumptions and calculations are what has uh, led to the conclusion that this air is acceptable. Uh, with the exception of ozone. So if you if you exceed the ozone threshold, um, the standard does require that an air cleaning device specifically for ozone um, be, be included in uh, the equipment. Next slide. Uh, the other steps of that built that indoor air quality assessment, uh, certainly reviewing the maintenance laws and your documentation for your system. Uh, there's a site assessment uh, similar to, uh, but more detailed uh, than uh, an energy audit. You're specifically looking at indoor air quality. Uh, there are some occupant surveys that go along with it, and it verifies, again, compliance with ASHRAE 62.1. There are some measurements that are taken for, for CO and if, if there are any uh, combustion equipment in the space or in the building, and then temperature and relative humidity. We also encourage you to consider um, recommissioning or retro commissioning. Um, uh, these, this is a quality assurance process uh, to make sure that you know the changes you ask to be made are actually made and that they're working and doing what you want them to do in your facility. So the last thing you want to do is to make some changes and then you realize, oh, I wasn't even effective. It didn't do what I wanted it to do um, or it did something else. So this um, is, a, is a quality assurance process um, that comes with a manual um, that helps you make sure that you get what you want. Next slide. And I'm sorry, I think I forgot to say next slide a couple of times. Um, so we encourage you to reach out to um, to your to your local HVAC professionals. Um, this may be um, your 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 design engineer. It, it could be a manufacturer's rep. Um, you know, if you if you talk to the, the folks who um, you know sold you your air handler, or sold you your chiller, or sold you your 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 variable frequency drive, these folks can help you. Um, they are very knowledgeable um, about the, the the ins and outs of their pieces of equipment. Um, Water treatment specialists, we didn't talk about water in this particular session, but um, if you've got water concerns, you must definitely want to make sure that you bring in your water treatment specialist. And then, of course, those TAB specialists as well. Those are the folks who balance your air system and make sure that everything is working properly, um, as well as energy management and facility IAQ consultants. Next slide. Um, there's some additional resources from ASHRAE. Um, you can visit uh, the Detroit Chapters website. We have a list of recommendations for um, HVAC and domestic water systems uh, that were um, uh, furloughed uh, for, uh, uh, for, for COVID-19. So we've got some reopening guidance um, here locally here in Michigan. And in addition to that, next slide, um, our international society uh, has a web page entirely devoted to COVID. It also has an email address that you can send questions to if you've got any questions. Um, and uh, there's a wealth of information on this page, including uh, answers to frequently asked questions. They've got building specific guidance. They look at schools, they look at hospitals and nursing homes and all sorts of types of facilities. Next slide, and that is that. Um, and I, 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 I forgot to put my clock in front of me because I realize when I'm doing the presentation, the timer goes off on my computer. So I don't know, let's see, okay. So we just have a, a few minutes remaining. Uh, I just wanted to make a note in our next sessions, DTE is going to be joining us for a five minute segment to kind of talk about some of the tools and resources they may have available to support these types of efforts with their energy efficiency programs and other technical support that they can provide. They have uh, some of these changes that Sonia touched on uh, may include equipment that would qualify for certain types of rebates. So I'd encourage you to check in with DTE, Consumers Energy, or any of the cooperatives that you might be working with across the state of Michigan. Our friends from Michigan Saves that were with us last time weren't able to make it today, but they also have wonderful tools that you can use uh, on their website, including a list of uh, some of these changes that have been discussed and 
um, a, a range of costs that they may have on your business, not including those other energy usage costs that uh, Sonia mentioned as you start to increase your outdoor intake and then having to condition that uh, air coming in, uh, it's, it's going to make some of your systems work harder and more often. So uh, there are some other impacts certainly that you'd want to consider. So we have just a few minutes left for uh, questions today, so we will uh, open it up. Okay, thanks, Sean. Um, I'm going to go ahead and try and get a couple of these in before our time is up. So the first question we have is, given the current pandemic, how should we treat HVAC systems with energy recovery wheels in them that you can commingle exhaust with supply? Also looking ahead, should we continue to inspect them in healthcare settings? So, <clears throat> I would encourage you to, uh, in general, for an energy recovery uh, device, uh, if it's if it's a, a wheel in particular, um, there is the um, likelihood whenever you've got an energy recovery device where the uh, these the supply side and the return side are co-located, you've got the opportunity for some uh, some transfer. Um, however. Uh, if the with an energy recovery wheel in particular, if the wheel is operating properly and the pressure differentials are uh, as they should be, uh, the leakage that you will have, the leakage that you'll see, uh, will be leaking from the clean side to the dirty side. That is from the uh, supply side to the return side. And so you want to um, evaluate your uh, energy recovery devices to make sure that they are operating properly. If upon evaluation you find that they are not operating properly, um, then the, 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 the team has some decisions to make, right? Do we want to um, repair and fix this? Do we have the budget to do that? Do we need this thing to operate, um, and are we going to 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 commit to making sure that it functions properly and that it is maintained going forward, so that it doesn't get um, uh, so that it doesn't uh, revert again, or do you need to turn it off and take it out of the system? Right, that is a that that is a a, a possibility as well. Um, so each each situation is different. Um, and needs to be evaluated on its own merits. But in general, if the equipment is operating um, as it is intended, and if it has been well maintained, then you should be able to continue using it. Simon, do you want to add anything there? Uh, most of the uh, applications in Michigan, I would say, fall into the category of of safe uh, to operate with. Yeah. First thing I usually look at is what is where is the return air coming from uh, that's being exhausted, and based upon where it's coming, you know, if it's coming from isolation rooms, then I would seriously consider uh, shutting it down. If it's coming oh, like absolutely. most are, just from general return air, office spaces, and things like that, then then, then no. Uh, Okay. Yeah, and the air, the air is classified as well. You know, you've got class one, two, three, and four air, and so yeah, you you can't um, you know certain certain air just needs to be um, exhausted, and you you can't um, you know reuse it, and you don't want to mix it at all. And so in that case, you know, I would I would hope that they were not um, that that a hospital would not be using um, isolation room yeah, you, air okay. in the ERB. Yeah. Well, uh, I appreciate that. I appreciate the questions. As you could tell, there's a lot of great information today that we didn't, so we didn't uh, have time to get to many of the questions today, but certainly in a couple of weeks, we'll be back with the next part of our presentation. I would encourage you to come back and join us so that we can uh, continue this great discussion with our uh, partners from ASHRAE that are guiding us through some of the challenges and opportunities within the HVAC space to ensure that we help to do everything that we can to contain COVID. So thanks again for joining and we'll see you next time.